Three, two, one. This is your Libertarian Podcast Crusaders, episode number 18. And this time we have uh, the opportunity to talk to a Libertarian lawyer, Paul. And you have a last name. That's yeah, kinda... yeah. It's Paul Kuhnberg. Kuhnberger. Kuhnberger, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> German, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you've been involved in, I guess, the Richmond Libertarian scene for quite some time. Um, what brought you to Libertarianism? Well, actually, I've been involved with libertarianism. I guess I've been a card-carrying member of the LP since August of 1980. Wow. And actually what brought me there was uh, I was at an uh, anti-draft march in uh, D.C. where uh, when they reinstituted draft registration, that was you know, a, a cause that I was very concerned about. And uh, it's just walking along with my friend. I said, oh, uh, they're the libertarians. I've kind of vaguely heard good things about them. So I just went over and chatted and turned out that they had pretty much uh, were what I already developed as my political views. So it wasn't a hard sell. I just pretty much went right there. Hmm. Yeah, anti-war is like a big thing of, with libertarianism and uh, used to be a big thing with uh, Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I was a uh, nominal Democrat then, I guess, mm -hmm. as opposed to being a Republican. Mm -hmm. And being drafted was, of course, fresh in everybody's mind at yeah. that time. Yeah, I, I had narrowly escaped it. So, oh, really? Yeah, the year my number came up, they abolished the draft. So, wow. wow. So I, yeah. you know, I was... Uh, which, which war was this being a draft for? Vietnam? Uh, Vietnam, yeah. yeah. So you could have come back like uh, Rambo. <laughs> uh, not likely, actually. My personal circumstances at the time, uh, I, I doubt I would have had to move out of my house. <laughs> some more privilege, I guess. All right. right. Yeah, that's some privilege uh, males have here, the privilege to uh, be forced into selective uh, service mm -hmm. and uh, have to sign up at a point of uh, threats of fines and imprisonment. Right. Get yeah, no yeah. loans or yeah, anything like that. Loans, right. You can't get student loans unless you uh, are properly registered with the draft. And I, I think it's mostly a control mechanism because it has very little to do with our current military structure. And in fact, uh, I think the military's worst nightmare would be to reinstitute the draft because of the way the military operations and organizations have evolved, I don't know what they would do with people. I mean, it's, who don't want to be there? <laughs> well, who don't want to be there or, or don't have the physical, technical, intellectual aptitude. Right. To, to They're be already low, lowering the standards so much. If they just grew up, grabbed a bunch of people from the civilian population, how bad would it be? <laughs> how much training up? Could they really spare? Right. Yeah, I was just reading uh, something about Westmoreland um, in Vietnam where he had intentionally dumbed down the standards. I mean, where, you know, Forrest Gump was actually an accurate reflection of uh, military policies at the time where they were doing that. Had in. an entire brigade of low IQ soldiers. Oof. Yeah. They slaughtered themselves. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And it was found not to be as, uh, uh, it was suboptimal in its results, I'll say. Right. <laughs> but that wow. was Westmoreland. <laughs> not, not the guitarist for Limp Bizkit. <laughs> West, Bor West Borland is what yeah. I was thinking. Okay. Yeah, Westmoreland. It's very similar. It was the commander. And actually, I'll tell you a brief funny story about Westmoreland. My dad had some upper level job in the Pentagon. And so he knew all these people. And uh, when we were cleaning out his house, I found this picture of Westmoreland copiously inscribed to my dad. And I said, well, where did this come from? Oh, that guy. And he said that the Army had employed a full colonel whose sole job was to follow him around in Vietnam. And any time he was going to do something incredibly stupid, basically to rat him out, to call 
the call of the Pentagon and say, you won't know. Well, I just to let you know what he's doing. That was my experience in the military. <laughs> yeah, well, you're a veteran, so you, you probably understand. Someone so. always like following, like my armor FUD, trying to find me to make any mistakes to report me. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that was our uh, brilliant leadership at the, at the time. So then you went to this uh, protest to, uh, to go against the draft, and then you realized that in the event they did do this, you sue the hell out of them and became a lawyer. Um, no, <laughs> no, Jobs that was for life. <laughs> no, that was basically uh, uh, a result of the times because uh, uh, lawyers were it was kind of a kind of a hot thing to be at the time, and uh, uh, particularly after Watergate, which was still fairly fresh, and that, and it was a uh, a way that I could stay in school longer. Mm. I, uh, hmm. And I was interested in law. I can't say it was an all-consuming passion with me or anything like that, but it was, it was something like, you know, you got to go out and get a job and do something. Um, so have you ever got it arrested? No. All right. You, just, you talk your way out of it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> not, not very often. I, I fortunately haven't had to. Right. Well, you're looking for your driver's license. You take all your legal... Uh, ID or something, right? Uh, well, that worked better when I was practicing in Maryland. <laughs> I, I called it my uh, get out of jail free card. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it wasn't that it would really get you out of jail, it would get you out of routine harassment. Right. You know, Just, like if uh, this guy knows, might know something, so I'm not even going to waste my time. Like, well, it's yeah. just that it, it, it would, you know, for example, a uh, couple of things. So I got pulled one time because my plates were rather expired and the guy just said get it straight as opposed to giving me a ticket and making me go down to court and do all this stuff and uh, another time this is actually in Richmond uh, I was uh, walking home from a party or whatever and got stopped and I guess because I I guess I look suspicious I don't know why and I showed him that and you know, he said, well, you've been drinking. I said, yeah, and I'm walking. You know, <laughs> is there a problem? And, and rather than being harassed or, you know, being brought in for being drunk in public or something, they just let it slide. But doesn't the state own you? So if you walk while drunk, it's actually a DUI? <laughs> uh, no, it can be uh, drunk in public. I right. had a uh, client. How are you who, supposed to get home if you go to the bar then? <laughs> Well, that's a good question. They were sending people, uh, this isn't so long ago, maybe five years ago, they were sending uh, cops into like karaoke bars right. in Northern Virginia. What? Yeah, and then making them blow in the bar. Well, if you were hamming it up too much on the karaoke stage, yeah, that's how they, they were that, like, that, that guy's a, drunk. That was their uh, probable cause, I think, is that you were too... Uh, Get this guy out of here. Call 911. <laughs> yeah, but... Uh, I, uh, client who was a magistrate and he told me that the cops would routinely bring in people that had blown like a zero two or a zero three which the limit is zero eight mm -hmm. and he would have to lecture them about no drinking is not illegal <laughs> <laughs> you know being drunk or being uh, <laughs> drunk driving is illegal but drinking is not illegal right. so wow very puritanical <laughs> I like uh, what they have in uh, Savannah where you have open container laws and you can kind of walk around and they don't seem to have a kind of, that kind of problem. No, yeah. and it's like that in Europe too. Right. New Orleans and other... Well, so you had a magistrate as a client. What's the most high-profile clients you've uh, ever had? Uh, not really high-profile uh, in the sense that you would like instantly recognize their name or whatever. But uh, the first case I worked on actually was a libertarian case. Hmm. Uh, in fact, it was so, it was so, I was so new I hadn't even been admitted to the bar yet. It was an election law case up in Maryland where uh, they were, there was the uh, incumbent congressman had literally died the day before the election and was reelected anyway, of course. And so they had to have a special election. Libertarians wanted to run a candidate, but under the law, he had like, I don't know, four days to collect, I don't even know how many, like 10,000 signatures. And so we sued them on the basis of uh, 
while uh, so anyway I was uh, waiting to hear the results of the bar exam so I didn't have much to do and myself and another student uh, or colleague at that point got in the same situation we picked up this case did all the legal research all the writing drafted all the pleadings etc mm -hmm. found a nice cooperative person to sign off on it was actually in the bar well anyway that case uh, was successful and eventually went to the United States Supreme Court so the first case I worked on went to the Supreme oh, wow. Court at successfully and uh, you know two years later when they finally uh, resolved all the attorney's fees claims etc I had enough money to open an office so that's how I got started on my own. In Maryland? Wow. In Maryland. Nice. Wow. Home run right off the bat. That's not too bad. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hard to, you know, what do you do for an encore? <laughs> yeah. so, all right. So that was, it was a high-profile case if not a high-profile client. All right. Uh, and the clients that you've had, though, uh, you've done, like, criminal defense cases and things like that? Yeah. Uh, you ever got off, like, somebody free knowing, like, in your heart of hearts, he was guilty? Um, probably, probably. I, I, you know, I don't, I, I don't inquire too closely on, you know, there, the job of the state is in criminal law, right. is to prove totally on them to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. It's, you don't have to say anything. The state has to prove everything. So really is, has the state produced enough evidence to, to um, prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. So it's not on a criminal defense attorney to second guess that result. But as a practical matter, um, a lot of that is assuming they do have the facts to prove it because in about 90% of the cases they do, and frankly people are pretty even transparently guilty. Um, then it really becomes more damage control. You know, how do you mitigate it? How do you uh, have the best possible result? I feel, feel like it's a good result if I walk out of the courtroom with a client, with my client. Right. As yeah. opposed to them going to the back. Right. right. Yeah. So you're a, bit, you're a defense attorney then, right? Yeah. And, you've, and you spent most of your career kind of representing people in different situations? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'd say so. I mean, I've... I've done some firm practice, and I, I work for an immigration firm, but we represented individuals. I've done some federal litigation, like the ballot access case and some other, mostly that. Right. I, but that was a long time ago, and I can't say it's a routine thing right. I do. Uh, what would you say would be the best thing to do if uh, a cop pulls you over? Do you say, like, uh, what seems to be the uh, officer problem? Do you kind of joke around? Or? Well, I, I, the, the, the best line of defense on that is not to get pulled over to begin with. And that may seem obvious, but one of the things I've noticed, maybe not without fail, but certainly more often than not, is that it's always for two things. You know, it's expired tags and driving while suspended. Mm. is speeding and drinking. It's, it's two things, because mm. the cops have to have probable cause to pull you over to begin with. So, you know, uh, that's sort of a common sense advice I give people is don't break two laws at the same time, because then it, you're asking for it. How can you know all the laws? How can you know how well, many laws you're breaking? A, well, that's a good question. There's something like um, 10,000 laws for any given situation that most people are just totally unaware of. So, which is really the second line of advice, assuming you do get pulled over, is don't talk to the cops. Just don't. I mean, name, rank, serial number. You know, uh, I guess you produce your driver's license, identify who you are, and that's pretty much it. Do you have to sign <clears throat> the, uh, the ticket, the citation? Yeah. I mean, what if you don't? Nothing. You're still charged with it. I mean, it's, it's not an admission like, of guilt. Yeah, they, they it's not. That. No. They no. don't go like, well, get out of the car. You're coming to jail. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. I wouldn't go out of my way to antagonize the police for no reason. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because. He, he, it's like a bear in the woods. 
You know, if you encounter a bear in the woods, he could tear you apart. It's like if you encounter a cop, there, he could do a lot of bad things. Yeah, they're you the wanna, ones with the guns. You want to so. take what precautions you can to just get out alive. Yeah, just, you yeah. know. And, and a lot of times, and one thing I've noticed over the years um, is there seems to be more of a, a, a yes-no situation you know, positive, negative uh, attitude these days with the police. Uh, in the past, I would always, you know, try to chat with them, you know, relate to them. I'd usually get out of the car. I don't know what they do to me now, but the reason being is just the psychology of this authority person leaning over into your space, you know, maybe with their hand on a gun, et cetera, versus standing face to face at eye level and then you relate to pers- people as individuals and as human beings and I think that's the dynamic you'd like to create. Unfortunately it seems like they're in a uh, compliance defiance mode and if you're too compliant then you're kind of weak and contemptible. What can I say? That it, kind of, it sets up that dynamic and if you're anything other than compliant, then you're defiant, in which case it puts them into that thing. So if you, in your interaction, I would just remember they're just human beings to trying to do their job and that you don't, you don't have a duty to make things easy for them, but you don't, there's no point in going out of your way to be belligerent or antagonistic or insisting on things that really don't matter. For example, signing the side, t- you know, a ticket. Go ahead and the window it. cracked and just <laughs> snapping no, the no, license no. out. I mean, you could do that. I find I that, am that guy. <laughs> I find that to be just unnecessarily conf- confrontational. Right. Right, what about this? Here's a scenario. Uh, say I'm drinking and driving, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I read this someone that maybe could work. I'm glad you're here. Uh, I get pulled over. I get out of my car. I get my cup of alcohol in my hand or the liquor bottle. Mm-hmm. Um, I take the uh, keys, I chuck them into the ravine, right? I drink, and therefore, when he comes and approaches me, I have no keys in my hand. I was not driving. (laughs) Yeah, I am drunk because he just saw me on your body camera drink or chug a glass of alcohol outside. I've I've seen those scenarios. I wouldn't recommend it. (laughs) Unless you're so drunk that it doesn't matter, <laughs> that you might as well do that. <laughs> and and I, I would argue if you're that drunk, you probably wouldn't be able to think of it or pull it off. <laughs> well, like, they'll, they'll hire, like, a toxicologist to say in court or something, like, well, he uh, couldn't have gotten as drunk as he was over the amount of time, like, you know, if you just had one drink in your car versus 12 before you, you know, a right. few hours ago. Yeah, and, and I just think that, you know, uh, Technical defenses like that are of only uh, so much use unless you really have uh, the will and the resources to pursue it all the way because that'll, more, you know, 99 times out of 100 get you convicted in general district court. Then you got to appeal at the circuit court and do it all over again mm-hmm. where you have uh, maybe more ability to specifically argue case law. I mean, it, theoretically, that exists at every level. I don't want to uh, impugn district court judges because a lot of them are just very good with the law and, and are not going to do that. But, you know, if you're going to make some sort of sophisticated, hyper-technical argument, you're probably going to have to do that in circuit court. And then if you get convicted there, you're going to have to appeal it to the Court of Appeals. And now, now you're talking about serious money, even assuming you win. So, right, you got to pay it for that, too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what about this guy? He uh, went to jail some time ago, got a life sentence, and he died. But <laughs> not before the nurses could resuscitate him and bring him back to life. <laughs> and now he's making the case that I just served my life sentence. I just, I died. I'm no longer here. I am a new person, new life. I just read that. I was intrigued by the argument. I'd be curious to see how that turns out. How would you defend that if you were? I think he's 
I mean, if you're doing a life sentence, you might as well. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you might as well make that argument. I, I, it, it poses some, you know, kind of interesting uh, scientific facts, you know, to say the least. Right. Of course, if you were revived, then how dead could you really be? Right. Technically, my client biologically uh, was dead. Uh, but it's still your now, client. Now, if he was buried in the ground and then came back to life, like punched through the coffin... That right. seems totally different, right? He's, That's not happening in just the hospital. He's earned it at that point. <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I think at some point you got to earn it. I, I, I could be wrong about this, but I think historically, if for whatever reason they hung you and the rope broke or something like that, you would be commuted, but I could be wrong. Right. Or like if you're in the electric chair and you didn't die, you should be able to be free after that, right? Well, you know, they keep trying. It, I <laughs> so Virginia, Virginia is kind of entering like a brave new world now that the Democrats are in control of uh, the state house and uh, they have a mission as it relates to gun rights. Right. So what are some gun? Um, I, you know, I think we're entering like a, a point where they want to ban assault weapons, for instance, mm-hmm. and they're talking about confiscations. Do you think that those things will just get challenged in court? And so, we won't have to worry about them actually passing those laws and accomplishing Well, I, I think there are two questions. Would it legally fly and to what extent? Um, that area of the law has been evolving, I'll say, and they do have some uh, precedential uh, uh, claims to have reasonable regulation. At what point does gun confiscation, though, you have a problem with... Uh, basically taking property without just compensation and assuming you could do that anyway. So you'd have to approach it under that. Uh, I guess you could have some, they could argue to have some sort of mandatory buyback or something, but I don't see how that would fly under a second amendment analysis. Um, I I was thinking of, um, I think it was Justice Black, it could be wrong, but a, a Supreme Court justice, when confronted with a First Amendment question, I think it was a First Amendment question, he said, well, what, a part, what about the part where it says, Congress shall not pass any law, is there any confusion about? I mean, it seems clear, that's, that was the extent of my, his analysis. And if I'm not mistaken, th- this was a guy who used to be in the KKK. <laughs> this goes back to maybe the 50s, 60s, something like that. And I think that's really the, the fundamental question with the Second Amendment and what I tell my friends who are uh, gun control types. I basically said, this is the Second Amendment. It's pretty clear. If you don't like it, then you should do what is necessary to modify or repeal it through a constitutional amendment. And if you can't do that, well, sorry about sorry your luck. About it. Yeah, <laughs> right. it, just, it just doesn't work. Right. So go to any of the uh, other number of countries in the world that uh, don't have these laws. Well, I you know just wonder if you know the you know I saw some memes you know with. Uh, 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 Glenda holding a gun, saying they must be very powerful <laughs> if they want to take government wants right. them so bad. take it away. Right. So I think that's really uh, uh, kind of a, a quandary uh, that, or, or a, a um, logical question you come up with. Uh, my wife, who is a, I guess, a hard pressed Democrat, is kind of a liberal is actually amazingly strong on the Second Amendment because she basically says, well, the Second Amendment is for ultimately the citizenry to protect themselves from, against the government. Whether that would be effective or not, I don't know, but it's just that that is the safeguard. And particularly in these troubled times, I don't know that that would be a good safeguard to... Well, know. like people always are criticizing Trump as a strong man or whatever. And, and what better time to realize, hey, it's important that regular folks have guns, right? Because if you don't like Trump, uh, what if he became a dictator and, you know, tyran- yeah. tyrannical nut job, you know? And- <laughs> well, yeah, what if? Uh, and, and the... Yeah, and so that's what I'm saying is I don't know where, what kind of logic they're using... Because the you know on the one hand they're concerned about uh, essentially presumably concerned about 
civil liberties and the rule of law and all of these traditional values, and at the same time want to disarm themselves. So I, 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 it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, and so I basically say, you know, fine, you don't like the Second Amendment, modify it. Right. It's fine that they don't like it. This is, why do they have to impose their dislike onto everybody else? This is what I find really hard to understand, is the thing is most gun owners are very law-abiding people. They don't. If gun owners were a bad problem, like it's hyped up to be, there would be a problem, but there's not. Yeah, it, 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 it's not. And I, I think we have to really, in terms of things like mass shootings and whatever, it's not access to weapons. I know, I mean, I don't even There's know. 10 steps that happen before the person does the bad thing. I don't thing. even own a weapon, but I, you know, I threw mine in the river a long time ago. But the, <laughs> um, but the, 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 there's an underlying reason for this that I had think just personally think has nothing really to do with uh, availability of guns. I think you have a lot of societal stressors. You have uh, a, a, a weak or non-existent mental health system. And I don't think red flag laws are the answer to that either. Right? I think they're exceptionally dangerous. <clears throat> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Can't you, uh, like, that, isn't that how you would challenge it? Like if the Democrats here in Virginia were to pass some of these laws for gun confiscations, would you say then then uh, you shouldn't shoot back? Uh, let the first person who it happens to give up the gun and then challenge it in court? I don't know. Well, anybody who would be affected by the law would have standing to resist it. I don't, and I think I think the first person should shoot back and kill as many as you can to show them, hey, you <laughs> He's better not get killed. So his wife is going to end up having to sue well, at, for him. Yeah. <laughs> at the end of the day, you need to remember they are the ones who actually have the overwhelming firepower, and unless you have some martyrdom complex, I, I don't think that's a good idea. There is one way, and I almost hate to even bring it up, because yeah, one way... Boogaloo. That, <laughs> yeah. They like could, the way you think. They could do it. Um, is they could pass a law that makes it illegal to sell or transfer guns or to purchase new ones. What about building them? Uh, I don't know. Well, the, the reason I say that... So that's protected under the First Amendment, I'm pretty I, sure. I would, I would think. Well, I guess you could do... You make it... Uh, you, in other words, so you wouldn't confiscate. They could get away with not confiscating existing weapons and all of that would entail and just make it illegal to transfer or sell or, or buy uh, or possess weapons ap could made after X day. And there's actually authority for that that I learned in law school when I was taking a seminar in constitutional law. I knew this was going to, at the time, was going to come back to be used someday, where the Eagle Protection Act of 1940 made it illegal to own, possess, um, purchase eagles' feathers, like from Indian headdresses or whatever after 1940. Well, the case was a guy had a headdress that was, everybody agreed, though, he lawfully acquired it. It was before 1940. It wasn't in dispute. But the Secretary of the Interior said, well, rather than uh, make a determine, you know, on a fact base, you know, case-by-case -case basis, we'll just say that, well, you just can't sell it. And the court ruled unanimously, by the way, that uh, that was just a reasonable regulation and that uh, they, it wasn't an un uncompensated taking <laughs> and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so, uh, so I knew the fact that Justice Rehnquist wrote the opinion, I knew it had to be bad down the road. Uh, that was sort of the consensus in my class was that this is going to be bad. We don't know exactly how yet but this will come back to bite us. Mm -hmm. And um, as a, a, a kind of a libertarian take on it, we, uh, we used that case to prove that the Supreme Court uh, was more obedient to the Soviet code than the American Constitution because in the Soviet law at the time, it said, you have all rights to property except as limited by the government. 
And everything's limited by the government. <laughs> and that, and that the U.S., and this is our first-year property book we pulled this out of, basically said that the right to sell property is but one stick in the property, rights to own property and can't be removed without destroying the right to property. So with the postulate was, which law applies? <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, I didn't mean to get on a sidetrack there, but that was the... Uh, Today you can't even collect uh, bird feathers in Virginia. It's legal. Oh, I, well, yeah. that's Taxidermy, one of those I think. Is, laws that you don't know yeah, about. Yeah, so like you pick up a blue jay feather, you go to jail. Yeah, and exactly. And so it, that's a, kind of gets back to why you don't talk to the police. Because you don't know that that, you know, who would, who would know that? Right. Is that your bird feather? Did you just pick that up? Well, yeah. So, mm -hmm. well, you're under arrest. So right. what, one tool I've always found in, uh, when you encounter police is they're always trained in the Socratic method, but they might not know that explicitly that they're trained in the Socratic method. Right. So you counter them with a question. So they are trained to give you a question. You answer their question and hit them with a question back. I, I, it throws them off guard. I think that's the way to handle it. I was going to say that is that, you know, because you have to interact. That's why I'm saying cracking the windshield and that kind of stuff. But how you know, fast are you going? How, how I, fast do yeah, you think I, 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 yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's just that simple. Well, was I speeding? How fast was I going? Because, for example, you're speeding. You're, you're going 60 in a 35 zone. Cop says, how fast were you going? Were you going? Well, you don't want to blatantly lie. You know, you think, oh, I was going like 38 or 40, something like that. <laughs> well, you just admitted you were speeding. Right. Can I have your license and registration? I don't know. Can you? <laughs> well, <laughs> again, don't be ridiculous. But you just say, but but yeah, but I think that's a way to interact right. without giving facts that can and will be used against you. There's an excellent uh, uh, YouTube video that I recommend to everybody. It, it's uh, it was done as a continuing legal education program in Virginia. And it was taught by a, a criminal defense attorney who was a law professor and a state trooper. And the title is, I think, Don't Talk to the Police. I saw that one, yeah. Have you seen that? It's a good one, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and the state trooper is particularly good because he just goes on and on <clears throat> explaining exactly why anything you say, if you talk to him at all, it can only be used against you. Yeah, it'll never be used. It can't be used in your favor. All right. It may provide facts that you don't may be totally innocent. And the professor kind of goes into this, where you can be giving what you you can be innocent, totally innocent. Believe, I mean, not not covering anything up, and still provide things that can be used to incriminate you. So, uh, I'd highly recommend it. Uh, it's. Uh, entertaining and it, it just really shows but I the, the, the how I've distilled that down is uh, you know people get called you know by a detective I, can you talk to me or whatever I, I, I say no because if they have enough evidence I'm assuming they did something you know if, you, if they have enough evidence to arrest you they will if they don't have enough evidence to arrest you Talking to them may provide the evidence. So don't, you know, because the, the tendency is, oh, well, I'll, I'll talk my way out of it, I'll explain it. But no, because all they're doing is trying to go for an easy victory by getting incriminating statements or a confession or what have you. And I think in this video they talked the statistics were something like 80 or 90 percent of people confess. Hmm. Um, I had a client. Very good example, we, you know, the standard question was the uh, defendant co polite and cooperative. <laughs> well, this my client was a little too polite and cooperative. She gets a knock on her door at nine o'clock at night, and there are two police standing there saying, "We got a report that you were smoking weed." I, her, I guess, her ex-husband or whatever was trying to get her in trouble. Wow! And and the red um, flag, that's that's early red flag. Wow! And she said, yeah, it's right here. <laughs> and I tried to argue. Oh, we just wanted to check on that. Have a <laughs> yeah, good day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she could have slammed the door in her face or said anything except that. They had no probable cause for a search. It was 
they they were even kind of embarrassed to be there. One of my mottos is if they're knocking, they you know you have the upper hand. If one of the, if they say we're the cops, we want to come in. I'd be like, hey, have you guys ever read the Fourth Amendment? You guys should uh, you know get to step in. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm just saying, and you don't, again, you don't have to be ugly or confrontational about it because then they can, you know, say, uh, well, uh, I don't know, something that gives them exigent circumstances sure. to come in. People need to be uh, comfortable saying no, uh, especially when they want to ask for searches. I was like, well, you mind if I just search your trunk? Uh, yeah, I'm yes. Yeah, no. Yeah. Yes, I, I mind. No, I do not. It's one of the things you should memorize, you know, is I do not consent to any searches. Right. This was a great case in Buena Vista, right, nearby uh, in Virginia. This guy was pulled over. I forget why. Um, it might have been a, like a day or two expired license plate mm-hmm. or something. And he ends up, uh, they, they want to search his car. The canine alerted uh, to, their, to the trunk. And uh, so he's out of his car at this point, and he steps out, and he locks it with his key. Uh, and so then the police can't get in the car. And so they're like, so there's like this sort of no man's land where they don't want to arrest him yet because they don't have anything to arrest him for yet. But they also want to look through the car, and they and so they ended up basically saying that he was um, obstructing their investigation by locking the car and uh, securing his personal property. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know the facts of that particular case, but he should have said, "Well, am I free to go?" Just right. take off walking? Well, no, just my only man walk. <laughs> Am I free to go? And they at that point they either have to arrest him for whatever or let him go. And I think there's some case law that once you've completed whatever investigation you need to do on a traffic stop, you know, yeah, his plates were expired and here's the ticket. That's it. They can't Hold you. They can't hold you indefinitely or wait for the drug dog to show up or whatever. But if you don't make any effort to go or ask them, then they can say, well, you consented to that. You just hung right. around. Well, the yeah. real war on police officers is them dying on the side of the road. So if we get them off the side of the road faster, it saves their lives. So we're helping them. You would think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are we allowed to do citizen arrests on police officers if they're, like, I don't know, speeding or something? Yeah, again, good luck with that. (laughs) (laughs) I guess it would have to be so egregious, like he's clearly beating somebody in a mall by himself, and it's like he's not on duty or something. Raping underage women in the back of his car. uh, Yeah. Which is a thing that's happened a lot recently. I mean, there are a lot of uh, uh, kind of an alarming number of abuse abuse by police. And I think to some extent that's always going on. That's nothing new. I think the the availability of social media and all that and and people citizens having cameras and whatever sunlight and, is the best disinfectant exposes yeah. more right right so and power corrupts so if these police officers have in the situation they're in they have total power over the person that they're talking with so yeah and 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 i think just some, again some psychology is that and these are just things I've noticed, I don't have any specific, you know, documentary evidence of, is that the police now are, you know, dressed up like RoboCop and are put in this uh, position that everyone is a threat, you know, that, which kind of feeds into the compliant, defiant problem. And that it, it, by dehumanizing both sides, it's harder for normal citizens to react in an appropriate way and it's harder and it puts the cops in kind of a situation where uh, the citizenry is dehumanized as well and I don't know uh, me personally I've been pretty lucky I really haven't run across in my interactions with the police even notwithstanding my get out of jail free card uh, which I really kind of joke about that it's not something that comes up but that I, I haven't really run across the police being a problem, and in some cases they've actually been a real help and benefit. So I, I don't want to paint that, but as the, but I do feel like these days 
being stopped or having any kind of serious interaction with the police can be a life-threatening experience, and I think people need to... Yeah. Yeah, Mark Mark J. Victor from Arizona is another libertarian uh, lawyer, and he's got a great discussion about what to do in a roadside stop Mm -hmm. and how it could... What you know, what you do could literally end up getting you killed, or right. you know, you could come out of it alive, which is you know the best. The best <laughs> yeah, option. but it's it's concerning that people have to worry about that. It's not a real high percentage, but it it literally can happen. I don't feel safe uh, when those lights turn up behind me at any time on the road. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. it's one of those things. They should be held more accountable, not less, right. because you know. But they. I think our culture right now is breeding a little bit of an adversarial culture in a lot of ways, and I don't think that that's healthy, but it's the hyper media, mostly. It's what drives clicks, so that's all right. Yeah, and that's a problem. Like I said, I'm not even sure that it's happening. But the violence is all-time low, so I'm okay with that. Yeah, I'm not sure it's happening anymore. I think it's just that if something happens in uh, Pascagoula, Mississippi or something, it's on the local news here. So it, it creates a percept, or on social media or on the internet, so it creates a perception that it happens more than it actually does. Um, coming up on the last minute here, sure. if you guys have any last questions to ask, I wanted to ask, um, what do you think about the um, fact that you can't find any laws to pay income tax? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you found that? The Irwin Schiff? I've, I've, <laughs> I've, 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 I'm familiar with that concept. It, it doesn't work. <laughs> That's one of these things and I, I, I would hope, uh, and with the internet, a lot of these misconceptions or uh, um, ideas have been promulgated when it's really not uh, uh, the law or anything that you would... I, I see references to this. Oh, well, the, the, the uh, 16th Amendment wasn't properly ratified, and therefore the uh, uh, income tax is totally illegal. Do I need a driver's license to cross <laughs> if I'm not being doing uh, interstate uh, commerce? Yeah, because everything affects interstate commerce. That was, deci- that was decided back in the 30s when, uh, regarding milk, whole milk, uh, where... You know, the farmer in one county was selling it to... So where does it end? Well, because it all... It doesn't. Because everything <laughs> affects interstate commerce. The fact that the guy was selling his milk, milk in, to his neighbor meant that milk from interstate commerce was being impacted somehow. Or there was the guy who was growing, like, wheat in his own field for his own consumption, and yet the fact that he wasn't buying the wheat from someone else affected interstate commerce, because otherwise he would have had to buy, you know, what? wheat from... from <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, so it's, it's been... Those things have been used to expand the power and scope and authority of the state and the government, and I'm saying you're... you're there, back in the 80s, I guess it was, there was a movement of the, uh, the, the you know, the tax, you know, all... Uh, resistors? Tax, yeah, tax resistors. And they all ended up in jail, were massively fine, because you can argue that all day long and doesn't make it real. I'll give you another example back from the 80s. There was a guy who was uh, arguing, I think, in a lot stronger case, that... I think the state was trying to eminent domain his property or something like that. And he was insisting that he be paid in gold or silver because in the (laughs) Constitution it says all state obligations must be paid in specie of gold or silver. And it seemed like he was on pretty firm ground. Wow, yeah. (laughs) But no, that doesn't apply. You have to take these Federal Reserve notes. So... You you know, uh, a lot of the more, I, I think it's important for most people to recognize uh, their interactions with the law are not always fair, just, legal, constitutional, or whatever, but I think you have to be, uh, have to understand what you're actually facing if you want to confront it, and unless you're willing to do that, then you're probably better off if you don't because some, some battles just aren't worth fighting, I guess. All right. Any questions? Yeah, that's um, that, that sort of leads into, like, I had a 
this is probably too overarching of a topic, but mm-hmm. just the uh, idea when I talk to other libertarians, I'll talk to motorcycle or guys on a motorcycle page on Facebook, mm-hmm. and they were doing 35 over the speed limit, and uh, and but they'll get into these different arguments, uh, and a lot of times there's lawyers in the group who will say that's just the way the law is, right? And just because it's wrong doesn't mean uh, there's anything we can do about it. So how do you talk to libertarians about? Well, yeah, the law is this way. It doesn't make it right, but here's here's your options as far as what you can actually do about it. Yeah, pretty much like that, uh, because I, I don't want to... You know, I get into uh, basement arguments with some like some guy was, I think, maybe it was the driver's licenses don't really apply. It's been held many times, the driver's license, and then they list all these citations, and just for fun I looked a few of them up and they had absolutely nothing to do with that or or only extremely well you have a right to travel yes you do have a right to travel but that does not mean the same thing as operate a motor vehicle Mm -hmm. but the people who are not trained in the arcane mechanism of uh, legal analysis can read this and, you know, understandably be confused or just assume it says what it wants it to. But believe it or not, lawyers are kind of forced. Uh, the, the old stereotype is we're going to change the way you think in law school. And, it, and to some extent, that's true. You have to look at things from an analytical point of view with using uh, precise terms that mean things that have legal definitions, not just what you, you might think they mean. And so uh, it's just hard. It's kind of hard to argue with a non-lawyer who's convinced of the rightness of their position. Right. They'll be the ones that says, well, there wasn't uh, gold fringes on that flag that was in the courtroom. <laughs> so technically, uh, we were in a state of distress. And uh, Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I haven't heard that one, but that sounds about, yeah, yeah. about Do right. you think that uh, the law equals morality? No. No. I mean, uh, the law... I feel very strongly we need the law. And if you've ever been in a place that... Do you think that the law applies to everybody equally? It should. It should, of it, course. It should. I mean, that's called the rule of law. You know, and people, I think, underestimate how absolutely essential that is to having any kind of civilized society. I know a lot of libertarians, uh, you know, are have an anarchistic bent, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> but if you've ever been to a place that actually where there was no rule of law, I think you kind of come to appreciate it. Uh, I uh, uh, traveled to Russia right after the communism fell, and it was probably the closest thing to anarchy I could even conceive of. And there was no rule of law. And... I asked one of my friends, well, how do you enforce contracts then? And he says, breathing exercises. I said, what's that? He says, being deprived of lack of of breath for like 30 (laughs) seconds or a minute will usually make people want to honor their contracts. And (laughs) while I appreciate the thought, it was, I don't think, the basis of (laughs) of a viable commercial or society. So you need the law it should be as limited as possible to uh, things that are actually a problem or confined within the Constitution. So I'm, I'm very limited in my view of what the law should or shouldn't control. But you have to have a, an independent judiciary that can't just be bribed or persuaded by political fortune. You have to have predictability so that if you, my same Russian friends, were amazed that I could pick up a phone and call somebody in California and order something and send them money and the product would show up, you know, without my knowing them or having, you know, being my sister's cousin's best friend or something. So uh, I think the rule of law is something that's really unappreciated until it's lost. That seems to be more like a a high trust society of um, people that keeps their promises. Mm-hmm. All right, so you right. go. To, I think I don't think that's. I find like people here kind of generally keep more of their promises, and like I'm going to deliver something, you know, that you order from Etsy or eBay or anything like that. Um, 
versus if I go to China, I don't know if I'm really buying the product that they're saying that it is, if it's a knockoff brand right. and whatnot. And I think the keeping word is a maybe keeping promises is a cultural thing. Well, yeah, and it's the better way to do business, frankly. Yeah. If if you don't, uh, not everything needs to be micromanaged legally or contractually or whatever. And I always tell people contracts are like locks on doors. They keep honest people honest. And if you know what you're supposed to do and it's clear, whether it's written or a verbal understanding and everybody just kind of honors their commitments, then you really don't need lawyers. People just act the way they should. All right. Utopia. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and common until fairly modern times. All right. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for coming on the show uh, and for uh, crusading uh, libertarianism in Richmond for so long. A well, great boon to, uh, I guess, towards our future success, I think. Well, I'm, I'm, everybody's got to do their bit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so with that uh, thanks for listening okay. stay liberated get off my property thanks Paul <laughs> <laughs> All right. thank you <laughs>